Hi, in this particular probably long video, we're going to have a look at pathfinding, which is uh, working out a route from our, our current position to some target destination position. Pathfinding is quite commonly used within games, particularly complex games, uh, for example a real-time strategy game where the player has selected a unit and has then clicked on a question that they want that unit to go to. It is up to the unit then to work out the best path that takes them from the current position uh, to where it is they've been told to go to. Uh, so we're going to look at a number of different algorithms that enable us to, to try to get from our current position to some defined target position. Make it, it's important to make a bit of a distinction here that the process of path finding is different and distinct from the process of path following. When we had looked at the steering algorithms, we saw that um, given a path, uh, we could use the steering behaviors to follow that particular path. So the things that we're looking at within this is really about building that path in the first place, etching out a number of connected points or things like that, that if they are followed, will bring you from your current to some defined target position. Important in terms of doing this is the underlying representation of the world, how it is we are actually defining our world. And uh, you know, that this, this will determine the type of path that we are outputting. We're going to have a look at three fairly common representations in terms of grids, waypoint graphs, and then navigation meshes. A um, bit at the bottom of this slide sort of alludes to the fact that pathfinding generally is looking at, at large static unmoving elements. Uh, so you may have a character walking through, for example, streets. Those streets may have other people that are moving about within them. Others are dynamic objects. That isn't the type of um, detail in terms of path following which would be returned by a pathfinder. Instead, we would assume that our, our steering behaviours would enable us to follow the path in a way that involves us bumping into any other moving objects. But let's have a look first of all at uh, grids. So a grid base or a tile based structure, now they could be rectangular or hexagonal tiles or grids. Um, they're quite an intuitive representation because we can easily visualize us chopping up our world into these uh, tiles or, or grid based structures. Each of the, the, the tiles that we have, we, we encode them with some additional information. Um, so for example, we could say that it is a passable tile, something the tile the character could walk on, or it's impassable, it's a wall the character can't uh, walk through. When we, later on in this lecture we'll have a look at um, A star and, and we'll see there that for, um, for, for path following you can do some more fancy terrain following techniques uh, where for example as part of our tiles we could give them a movement cost uh, to say how much, or how much time needs to be spent to, to walk through this particular tile. And this is the tiles, they're fast lookup. If you know the location of a character, it's very easy then to map that onto a tile uh, location. Assuming tiles have a fixed width and a fixed height. Uh, given a particular tile location, it's very easy to consider the surrounding tiles to, to look up, left, down, or right, or whatever it's going to be. So very fast access neighboring tiles. And finally, it's, it's a complete representation of the level, which is to say it you know, doesn't miss out any bits. When we have a look at waypoint graphs in the next slide, you'll see that's an incomplete representation. I'll give you a, a means of comparing and contrasting. But for tiles, um, we, we can sort of cover the whole region, the whole world, with, um, with a set of tiles and not miss any bit of it. So next up are, are waypoint graphs. And you see an example on the, the top right. Uh, basically, we have a number of waypoints, points. And these waypoints are then connected to a select group of, of, of connected ones by straight line movements. So that if I'm on a particular waypoint and I want to get to another one that I connect it to, I walk in a straight line to that waypoint. And it's important it's in straight line because then basically by following that I, I can safely get from one to the other without bumping into any bit of the environment. Um, so advantages, it, it lends itself to quite complex environments where you may have corridors or curves or, or things that restrict movement. Um, tiles are not so good for that because then you may have to have a very small tile size. Uh, you can have a lot of flexibility over it, so you can decide where those waypoints are placed, uh, how many they're connected to, 
Um, you could have, for example, ladders. So you'd have a waypoint at the bottom of the ladder, another one at the top of the ladder. So very, very flexible. They are, however, an incomplete representation of the level because we're not modeling the whole uh, world. So if you look at the, the diagram up in the top left-hand corner, we've got a waypoint B. Um, and this may be our destination we're trying to get to. If you look down towards the middle, uh, the bottom, we've got a waypoint A. And I could have a character then that is trying to get to point X. Now, they want to follow the waypoints by way of doing this. So they need to work with what is their closest waypoint to them and then how to get to that waypoint without bumping into anything. As soon as they got to the waypoint, then I can run my Pathfinder and it'll tell me which waypoints I want to follow to get to a waypoint which is close to my destination. But thereafter, again, I have to work out how to get from that waypoint to the actual destination itself. Uh, so there are some additional uh, complexities involved in this. Final one we want to have a look at is a navigation mesh. They tend to be used a lot within three-dimensional games. Uh, so there it's um, basically a walkable surface. We are actually defining the, the whole surface that characters can walk on. And we do that using convex polygons. So rectangles are more commonly triangles, um, as you can see in the, the diagram on the top uh, right. It's, it's a very, very flexible setup. It may be a little bit difficult building the walkable mesh in the first place, but once you have it, then it is remarkably flexible. It's a complete, or can be a complete representation, so there's nothing stopping us from actually defining the full surface on which we want characters to walk. Because we're using convex shapes, for example triangles, a nice property of a convex shape is that if I find myself standing on a convex shape uh, at a particular point, and I want to get to any other point in that convex shape, it is a straight line that I need to walk in. So I can walk in a straight line without leaving it. So the other notion of concave, that may not be the case. So convex is, is a nice safe option here. We'll see in the next slide that we can actually also use this for collision detection. So because we have defined the walkable surface, it's then reasonable to say, well, why would you want the character ever to leave the walkable surface? So beyond using it for a pathfinder, we can also use it for doing collision detection as well uh, and to keep the character on that walkable surface to prevent them from leaving. Very flexible, works for 2D games, works for 3D games. So it's, it's maybe more sophisticated than the other ones, but this arguably is, is as good as, it's, uh, as, as it needs to be uh, within uh, a game. Okay, so there's three different ways we could represent our world. Now we want to have a look at a number of different algorithms that would enable us to pathfind around our world. All of these algorithms will more or less work for each of these three different representations in more or less the same way. Um, I'll largely assume in, in the stuff that follows that we're looking at a grid-based representation, although the other ones, waypoints or navigation mesh, they're, they're, they're simple extensions um, thereof. So let's have a little bit, a bit more of a thought then about what it is we are trying to output. So we want to run our algorithm and we want it to give us a path. And when we say a path, we mean a list of cells or points or nodes that we will give to an agent to follow to get from their current position uh, to the destination position. A little bit of, of terminology that um, if there is a path from the source to the endpoint, uh, and if we're using an algorithm that is guaranteed to find it, no questions here about how long it might take or how much memory it might take, but if at some point it is guaranteed to find it, then it's known as a complete algorithm. It will get you to your destination. Um, time and effort, though, are the, the two factors, ideally, that we want to, to minimize. We will be looking at different algorithms, so they will potentially give us different paths. So we need to have some way of working out, well, which path is better than another one? And there, there's lots of different ways of doing this. So one of the things we want to assess is the quality of the final path. Most obviously, that will bring into account the distance, just how long or how far apart is this path? Are we getting there in as direct a route as we possibly can? Some of the other approaches may actually look at other things like the naturalness of the path, if it's something similar to what a person would follow. Alongside that, it's also important to take into account how much time and effort, CPU resource or memory, was required to be expended to calculate that path. 
So we want to spend the least amount of, of effort, if you like, or the least amount of resource to be used in, in generating the final path. So let's start off. We're going to look at a, a few remarkably simple techniques that in many cases actually are perfectly fine and then work our way up to more sophisticated ones and then finally get onto what is currently the gold standard if you like. So here's a here's the start of our 10. We will simply try to seek towards our target location. Go straight towards it and if there's something in the way we're going to try to move out of the way. So we've got a while goal it's not reached we will move straight towards our goal say using seek. If we are blocked then we are going to move randomly one step to the left or one step to the right. Uh, so just sidestepping in a random direction. Very, very simple, uh, remarkably simple setup. And if you look at the, the graphic that we have down where it's mostly an open environment with some trees, that if you're about to bump into a tree while well, moving to the side, left or the right, will get you past that tree. Uh, actually, in, in, in an open environment with sort of small and sort of sparse obstacles, that works perfectly fine. Here's something that's a little bit more sophisticated. This is basic seek within obstacle tracing. Uh, so in this case, whilst our goal's not moved, but again, we're going to move directly towards it. But if we have an obstacle in the way, then we're not sort of randomly going to the left or to the right. We're going to pick um, either a, a clockwise or counterclockwise, going to the left or the right, and then trace our way around the particular object until we get around it. So a situation here, we'd hit the wall and then we would trace the wall out and go around. Um, and you see a bigger example now in the top right. It works better than the previous one because if we're randomly going to the left or to the right and we hit a large object, we could spend a lot of time just randomly sidestepping to the left and right and not getting very far until we're lucky enough to, to get around it. So again, a simple extension. Very simple algorithm to code and, and works reasonably well for large outdoor open environments with a sort of few biggish obstacles um, in, in, the, in, in the way or in the environment. So how do the, these algorithms, how do they work? So if we were looking at this type of environment, they actually work quite well. Um, they will broadly get you to your, your target. Um, yeah, it looks perfectly reasonable. But then if we move to other environments, for example, this one here, where um, the random sidestep one is likely to get stuck in that sort of end bit or the tracing one, depending on which way you decide to trace, could go around the map in a very illogical, long, direct uh, route to it as opposed to just going straight towards the target point. So these simple approaches, generally speaking, they work for outdoors, open environments without you know, with, with obstacles, but no, nothing really complicated. They do not work for indoor environments where there may be walls or gates or doors or, or things that otherwise severely restrict motion, movement and motion. So in that sense, they're good, but they're not good enough. So we want to have something that improves upon uh, those techniques. We'll be looking at a, a few, but just, just as a final aside, um, what you may also find within some games is the idea of leading down a, a breadcrumb trace. That as a character walks, you, you leave behind invisible to the player breadcrumbs. And that could be used by an AI character to, to follow after the player. It could be used for tracking or other things um, as well. Right, so we've looked at a few simple forms of pathfinding. Let's look then at more complex forms that, that will work within an indoor environment with a lot of enclosed uh, or enclosing lines or spaces that, that sort of prevent straight line movement. We're going to, to, to look at um, four different techniques. So breadth first, then best first, then what's known as the Dijkstra search, and then finally the A star search, uh, which, which you know, is, is, is what is used nowadays. And all of these, the three earlier ones, will help us build up towards A star. All of these algorithms share something in common, um, two lists in particular. They all have an open list and they all have a closed list. The open list, it contains a list of all of the, the next possible steps, but yet steps that we yet to take. So these are all of the things that we might be able or we will be able to work to next. 
And, and as part of that open list, that, that if you like, contains our, our selection of next steps. Any point in time, we're going to take one from the open list, and that represents our next step forward within our world. The closed list is a list of all of the locations that we have been to, that we have visited. So we don't want in our, in our Pathfinder to loop around in ourselves. We always want to be considering new spaces that we haven't been in before. So the closed list will keep track of the locations that we've already been to. So we'll show you an example here just in terms of, of how these lists uh, work. So we have a grid, we have a starting square, and we've got some destination end square we're trying to get to. We have an open list, and we have a closed list. Initially, um, when the program's run, our open list is, uh, is empty, and our closed list is empty. So what most of these algorithms, what they'll do first of all, is that you will have a starting point, where it is you're working from, and they will push that onto your open list. So that is your very first step. You, you step or start from your start point. The algorithms will say, whilst the open, loop, open list is not empty, if we ever we get to a point where our open list is empty, and we haven't yet got to the end, it means that we have run out of steps. There is no way for us to reach the end. It's not something that is reachable, so it's impossible. So whilst the open list is not empty, we're going to keep trying to find our way to the end location. We will do this in that we will take one of the nodes, or one of the, the listed values from our open list. Okay, there is only one at the po this particular point in time, but later on, mid-path finding, there could be lots of different options we could pick from this. So we pop one from it. We check to see if the one we took from the open list is what we're trying to get to. If it is, then we find our path. Um, it isn't in this case. The else is that we then create the successor nodes. We say that, okay, so I've been standing in 2-4, that's the one I took from my open list. Where could I walk from this particular location? And you determine all of the points you can visit, that you haven't really visited, from that location. Now, they get pushed onto the open list because they represent the next step. So the open list then contains the the new positions you could move to from that particular one. And onto the closed list, we push the one that we have picked. Now, if we were to repeat that process, for let's say, for example, we took out um, one, three, that particular square, we would take that out, we'd work out where we could go from one, three that we haven't been before, so that would be uh, one, two, and two, two. We would add them into the open list, and we would push, for example, one, three onto the closed list. And we'll show you a few examples as we go through this here. But that's, in essence, how all of these different approaches uh, will, will, will work uh, in terms of behind their algorithms. Two key questions. So which node should be popped from the open list? Whenever we have a lot of nodes in the open list, for example, you can see now we have eight nodes. Well, which one of those should we best pick if we're trying to get to our end point? And then also what successor nodes should be created? And, and again, are we adding in ones we've been to or are we just creating new ones that we haven't visited? Um, so there are the two key questions that these different algorithms will, will differ. Um, primarily in terms of the choice from the open list is the key differentiator. So we'll start off by breadth first search. Uh, this is, this is a, a dumb a brute force search. It's not intelligent. Uh, we'll do it. So apply by apply. Uh, which node has popped? The node that's been waiting the longest. So nodes get added on, but the one that's been there waiting for the longest one, that's the one that we will tag. Which nodes are added? Every node around the current node that is not impassable, we can reach it, or it hasn't been already created. So here we have an example. We've got a start node, we've got our end node. Uh, except this time we now have some black impassable squares that we're not allowed to go through. And we want to work out the best path from the start point to the end point. Now, initially we pass on our start. That's the only one we can take off. We take that off and we add in every node that we can get to that uh, is, isn't really an open list and isn't impassable. So we add in the total then of seven other nodes and the surrounding ones. That gives us a list of seven nodes We've got to pick one of those that's been waiting the longest. Now, all of them have been waiting exactly the same length of time, so it's an arbitrary choice of one from that seven. So let's say, for example, we took the, the, uh, the one at uh, position one, three, uh, sake of argument. 
So we took that particular one off the uh, open list, we'll add it into the closed list, and we'll push on now to the open list the two new squares that we can get to from that square that we haven't already visited. We then repeat that process. We take off the one that's been waiting for the longest. Now, we, we took out one from the original group of seven. That still leaves um, six we can pick. So we're going to take out the next one. This is the one of the sixth. And we add on the new square for that. That leaves us then five other values we haven't visited. Let's say we took off square one, four. So just to the left of start. Now, we can take that off. We can consider it. But there's no new squares we can get to. It goes on the closed list. And if we took off the value just to the right of the start node, again, we'd have a similar analysis that, OK, it's, it's now being considered. There's no new nodes. Um, basically, we get down to the ones at the bottom. We'll add in their values, add in those values. So at this point, we've considered all of the initial seven nodes that we added on. And we're asking, well, what, one was, what one's been waiting the longest? That's actually the one up uh, in the, sort of the top leftmost green one. And we'll go to that. And we will carry that process on, ply by ply, expanding out until we reach our end node. And you can see an expansion here as, as it sort of emerges and, and swarms out from its particular position. It's an exhaustive search, uh, systematic, it's not clever. It uh, generally consumes an awful lot of CPU and memory time. This is not an efficient search. It guarantees to find the path that has the fewest number of nodes. That's not necessarily the same as saying the path of the shortest distance. And we'll see that when we look at the movement cost and things like that. It is a complete algorithm. If there is a way of getting from the start to the end, it will find it eventually. So breath first, it, it works. It's not smart. It has some serious disadvantages. Let's see if we can prove upon it. I'm going to have a look at best first search. Which node has popped the node that is closest to the goal? So we are not just going to pick any old node. We will pick one that is closest to the goal. That's where we want to go to. So here we are using some knowledge about our, our environment that we're searching through to more intelligently pick which node from our open list we want to do. Now, it's important here to realize that when you say the node that's closest, you, if, if you know precisely which node is closest, uh, and you know this for all of the points, then you already know your closest path to follow out. Um, so when we're talking here about the closest node, it is a guess, it's a heuristic. We're going to have a number of nodes. We're going to pick the one that we think is probably closest. We're going to have a guess. Um, but we're not going to be sure that it really is close until we consider all the, the surrounding nodes. Um, so quite often, the heuristic value that we're using is a straight line distance. Okay, if I were to travel in a straight line from this node to the destination and nothing got in the way, how far out uh, is it? And I pick the one with the lowest distance. So we'll have a look then at this. We're using Euclidean, straight line distance. Here I have my start node, here I have my end node. So I still add in my same seven different nodes. Um, but I'm picking the one out of those seven that I think is closest to end. Now, initially, I'm likely to pick the one to the right of start, because I think out of the seven, that's the one that's closest, based on a straight line distance. Whenever I then take that node out and I consider its surrounding nodes, I realize, oh, all the ones I haven't got on are all impassable, so I can't go any further down that. So I go back to my open list, which, which now contains a total of six nodes. And I pick from that the one that I think is closest. And that's likely to be the one to the, the right and just under the start. Uh, so the one down there. That lets me add in three additional nodes now to my open list. And I'm repeating that process. So out of the ones I have in the open list, I pick the one I think is closest, and closest, and closest, and so on, until I end up hitting my end target. So it tries to head straight towards the, the target. It uses fewer resources than breadth first, obviously. Uh, well, it depends on that, the particular map, but the majority of cases uses significantly fewer resources than breadth first. It tends to find reasonably good paths. Notice here we're not saying optimal paths, so there may be a better one, but it does a fairly decent job. It's a complete algorithm, which means that if there is a path that'll get you from the start to the end, 
it will find it eventually. Um, so it, it, if it's there, it will get it overall. So that's, that's not a bad setup. There are some problems with this, though. You can see a couple of examples here that if you look at the one, let's say, on the left-hand side, first of all, because we head straight towards our goal, we'll, we'll sort of head into the corner of the room before we realize, oh, there's a wall in our way, and then we'll have to sort of backtrack around that. Um, or you can see the example on the right, where we have sort of gone straight towards it, we bumped against the wall, and that sort of led us around, and we've missed the particular path. If we had gone up at the start, we would have got to our destination in, in a quicker time. Um, so because we're heading straight towards it, sometimes the decisions that we make are not going to be optimal. They, they'll, maybe they'll get us there in the end, um, but there may not be the most optimal path. Now we want to consider how do we get a more optimal path, and we're going to have a bit of an aside, we're going to look at Dijkstra search. And, and this is not better than breadth first, or it's worse, but it's adding in a an important component that will appear in A star. So this, this is another way of, of, of calculating paths. In this case here, it's not heuristic, we're, we're, we're not worrying about how far we are away from the goal. What we're doing new in this one is we are actually measuring, keeping track of how costly each path has been. So we are precisely computing and remembering the cost of the paths that we walk along. Uh, Based on those costs, we're going to keep picking the path that has the lowest current cost as the one that we want to take us, or think will take us, uh, best towards our destination. So which node has popped? The node that's attached to the path with the lowest cost. And we, we add in the usual things, surrounding nodes, things that are not impassable. So here's how this would then look. Same setup before, start and end node. I add in my initial values. Now, initial values all have a movement cost of one. So it takes one step from my start to get to those particular nodes. Now, the node with lowest cost, okay, all of them have the lowest cost. We're just going to pick one at random. Let's say we pick that. Then we're adding in a few nodes with cost two. So that is saying to get to those points from the start point, you have to have two steps to get to it. And we carry on adding in three, adding in, or sorry, adding in twos for, for these ones here. Now at this point, all of the ones have been processed. We have all of our two cost paths available. And we will then pick one of those two costs and generate our three cost paths from that. From the three cost paths, we'll generate the four cost paths and the five cost paths. And then finally, the six cost paths. And you can see at this point that we've got a, a different route to the one that we followed when we were doing the best first, when we were heading straight for it. Best first took us a total of seven steps to get to the end node. If we had gone up, we'd actually do it in six steps. So by measuring this precisely in terms of the distance, uh, we can work out what is the, the optimal path uh, to the destination. It's an exhaustive search. It isn't a, smart, a fast search. It is at least as resource as intensive as the bread first one. It's guaranteed, though, to find the optimal path. Um, because we can take into account the precise cost that it takes to go from one square to another. It could take into things like terrain cost or things like that. Uh, so it does give you a very good uh, or an optimal path. If it's a complete algorithm, if there's a solution, it'll find it. But again, it's not resource efficient. Just an aside, Dijkstra's search actually does tend to be used in, in quite a lot of games. If, if you've got an AI-controlled character that's trying to find, for example, the nearest health pack, um, you would run a Dijkstra search or extending out from the character to, to then uh, until one of the squares you consider is, is, for example, a health pack, and you know, okay, this is my closest one, and this is how I get to it. So it, it does actually have a use. Now, we're more or less there. We're about to have a look at A star pathfinding, which is the gold standard. It's the one that games use. For A star, we're going to cherry pick a few uh, aspects that we like. We're going to combine best first with Dijkstra. And we'll use different aspects from these to combine together to produce a nice algorithm, which is called A star. In particular, we're going to have two cost values. We'll have a heuristic cost, which is our guess of how long we think it's going to take us to get to the destination. And we'll have a given cost, 
which is actually how long it did take us to get to the particular point that we're in. So if you look at the diagram down at the bottom, we have a yellow square, a start node and an end node. The given cost is the actual cost it took us to get to that yellow square. So we know precisely that is accurate. The heuristic cost is our guess, normally it's a straight line guess, how long it's going to take us to get to the end. You can see there we're sort of guessing it's going to be, say, in all three steps. Which node has popped? The node that has the lowest overall cost. To get that, we have to combine um, the, the two cost values together. Now, you can simply take the given cost and the heuristic cost, add them together, that's your total cost. That works perfectly fine. Sometimes, in some cases, you want to weigh them slightly. That if you weigh the given cost more, uh, you have a slightly more cautious algorithm. If you weigh the heuristic cost more, you have a slightly more sort of eager algorithm that tries to get straight uh, towards the, the goal. So you can weigh them in different ways. So let's have a look at how this algorithm works out. We've got a start, we've got our end. We add in our first set of values. And you can see here, we actually have a mixture of values from 7 uh, down to, to 5. So let's have a look at the value of 7, first of all, the one in the, sort of the, the, the top left-hand corner. So to get there from our start node, we had to have one step out. So the given cost was 1. It took one step to get to that particular square. Our heuristic cost is 6. We're guessing from that square, if we were to walk straight across to the right, it would be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 squares would get us to the end. So our cost for that square then is 1, the given, plus 6 the heuristic guess. If we go the other way to have a look at the 5, so let's say consider the 5 to the right of the start. So it's a cost of 1 to get to that, and our straight line cost is we think if we can go in a straight line and nothing gets in the way, it will take us 1, 2, 3, 4 squares to get to the end point. So there our total cost is 1 plus 4, or 5. So that's how it's calculated. We're popping off the node with the lowest cost, so we've got the two fives, we'll maybe take off the top one first, realise there's nothing to add on. The second one at the bottom, we'd pull that off, and we'd realise, OK, we can add on a few here. And we add on a six, uh, sorry, seven, a six, and a five. So we still have another five. So let's look at the five. This is one down at the bottom in the middle. So to get to that, it took two squares, or two movement costs of two, from the original start to go diagonally down to get down to that five. And then our, our heuristic cost, our guess, is if we're going in a straight line, nothing gets in the way, it'll be one, two, three, again diagonally going up, it'll take us to the end. So we're happy then. We've got a cost of five, we're, we're still willing to keep this on. Next square, we realise, oh, hold on, right, it's, it's gone from five to six. So it took one, two, three to get to the six, and it's still taking one, two, three to get to the, the end. Now, we've got a couple of sixes in, in our, our diagram here. That's our, our next lowest overall sets of cost. So let's say we, we pick the, the six at the, the bottom. That ends up with cost of seven. So one, two, three, four to get to it, and then a guess of one, two, three remaining. So seven, fair enough. We have a six up at the top. So that becomes the path that we then explore. So we go to the six. We add in the new squares. We still have a six. Add that in. We still have a six. One, two, three to get to it. One, two, three to get to the end. And we can follow that through, and ultimately we will then end up at the end. So it's a nice algorithm that, that sort of combines the, the direction of travel that Best First provides, but with a precise estimate in terms of actually how long is it going to take based on our guesses as well. And we'll end up giving you um, an, an optimal path. On average, uses much fewer resources and likes to our breadth first. Is it admissible heuristic? Um, I'll talk about this in a second. If we're talking about a straight line distance, um, so you're, you're guessing you can go in a straight line and nothing will get in the way, then it is guaranteed to find the optimal path. But we'll talk about underestimating and overestimating heuristics in a little bit. It's also a complete algorithm. If there is a solution, it'll find it. So by way of the algorithm then, um, we create our start node, we push it onto our open list, we work out the cost, so that's the heuristic cost from start node to the end node of doing that. While our open list is not empty, we are popping the node with the lowest cost, and that becomes our current node. We do a check to see if the current node is our destination, if it is, we're done, we find, we can backtrack, uh, back out and get the path. If it isn't the case, 
then we want to say, okay, for the current node, let's work out where we can go from that node. So if we're using a grid-based structure, it'll be all of the surrounding grid tiles. If we're using a waypoint, it's all of the connected waypoints. So for every node connected to the current node, we create a successor node. Um, so there we're taking into account, giving it a new cost. How long does it take to get to that based on my given cost plus the new given cost? Add it in then our heuristic cost to that. We do a check to see if this successor node, if it's one that we have visited before. So in other words, is it really part of the open list? Now, if it is, we're not immediately ignoring it. We actually do another test. We check to see, okay, so I've already added this node onto our open list, but what was the cost that I had put into it? And if my new way of getting to this, because this will be a different way of getting to the same point, if my new way of getting to it has a lower cost, in other words, I can get there in a more efficient way, then I replace the one that's stored in the open list with this new better path. So again, it updates um, squares that you've seen to take into account new paths that you've found. Otherwise, um, if it uh, hasn't been, you know, if it doesn't have a lower cost, we're just simply ignoring it. The else then is that if it hasn't been visited before, we're then just simply pushing it onto the open list. It becomes one of our new open list entries. Um, having then processed that particular value that we selected from the open list, we push that onto the closed list. And that really concludes then the, 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 the sort of the if bit or the while bit. And we'll keep on doing that either until we run out of things in the open list or until we reach our goal at the end. Uh, once we find the goal, we do have to backtrack through our, our series of points to build up the path, but that's, that's easily done. There are different types of heuristic. As mentioned, an underestimating heuristic is one that underestimates the distance. Um, it, you know, you've, okay. it has to be compared against an overestimating heuristic. Overestimating heuristic is one that, that, that will, you know, I, I, okay, I, I think it's going to take me you know, 20 meters to get to my destination. And it turns out it only takes 10 meters. So there I've overestimated my total cost. Underestimating is where I think, okay, I think I'll take 20 meters to get to the destination. Turns out it takes 50 meters. So a straight line heuristic, one that heads straight to it, it is a underestimating heuristic. It's either going to get it right, which is fine, or it's going to underestimate the distance. There'll be something in the way. If you have an underestimating heuristic, generally it takes longer for the search, um, but you are guaranteed to get the best possible path. It will turn you an optimal path. If it's an overestimating heuristic, it takes on some of the properties of best first. It heads straight towards it and you might miss the optimal path, but it generally uses less resources. So again, it's a sort of you know, swings and balances in terms of, of, of or, or swings and roundabouts, in terms of how it is you want to, to do this here. There you're weighing up the cost of getting always the optimal path versus the extra time and memory that it would require uh, to do that. One of the, I mean, pathfinding, there's lots of different extensions to it. One of the nice extensions of A stars was known as hierarchical pathfinding, is where you may be able to perform pathfinding at different levels. So, for example, if, if uh, we were, say, planning a, a trip to, to, to Spain or whatever, uh, traveling by car, we might decide first of all, okay, which countries are we going to travel through? That would be our top level pathfinding. Then within each of those countries, we would decide, okay, which particular major roads would take us through that. Um, maybe we might go through a city. Again, you go down into that level and you pathfind through that. So it, it supports the ability to do high level pathfinding and then to refine that down as you, for example, go into a smaller region. Uh, the example here is one of, of, of pathfinding around the number of buildings or you could ask a character to go into a particular building, into a particular room within a building, um, and you have initial pathfinding at a high level, working out how to get to the right building, through that building, and then to the particular point uh, in the room. One of the difficulties of doing hierarchical pathfinding is, is actually the heuristic, is the guess of how long you think it's going to take you to, to walk through, for example, a building. Um, so, so there... You know, a straight line cost, a, a sorry, Euclidean cost, you know is going to be probably quite wrong. So you pick one that's a bit higher, but you want to try to get one that's as accurate as you, you can be. 
Another nice aspect of uh, A-star is, is the notion that you can add in train cost. So because we are measuring the given cost of how long it actually took us to walk to a particular destination, we can say that it takes a different number of points to walk through a certain tile. Um, so different types of terrain could be linked to the object, could have a different movement cost associated with it. So it's very easy to extend A star so that it does take into account uh, that type of, of terrain movement. So two key takeaways from this. Pathfinding is useful. It gives a very useful ability to our AI-controlled entities, particularly within indoor environments or environments where there's lots of walls and doors or things like that, which will make it difficult for steering behaviours to work. A star, quite a nice algorithm, it's the de facto standard, um, very efficient, uh, gets you good quality paths, lots of ways it can be extended. So if you do need to use pathfinding, A star is probably uh, the way to go.